Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, open our eyes to understand your word. Open our eyes to see your glory, to see your beauty. Thank you for reconciling us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, The scripture reading this morning coincided with uh, what we will be reviewing. We're just going to focus in on verses 18 and 19, but I wanted you to have the fuller context. uh, So that's why the scripture reading uh, went from 17 to 21. You'll see in your outline that we're going to look at five different aspects of reconciliation. The first is the what of reconciliation, so basically what is reconciliation. Then we're going to look at the source of reconciliation, the mediator of reconciliation, the recipients, and uh, finally the responsibility of reconciliation. So let's begin by reading uh, verses 18 and 19. This is 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So to begin, what is reconciliation? To put it simply, it's essentially the restoration or the reestablishment of a broken relationship. So when you talk about reconciliation, you're already uh, presupposing that there was a relationship that was whole and complete prior, and now the relationship is in some sort of broken state. Something has happened, maybe you said something stupid, or maybe, maybe you didn't do something you, you were expected to do. Something has happened that has broken the relationship. And reconciliation, then, is the process by which that relationship is restored to health and you're now at peace with one another. The relationship is now whole again. Jesus actually gives us a command concerning reconciliation uh, in Matthew 5. So flip back there real quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be reading uh, just a couple verses here. Matthew 5, if you remember, is the... Uh, Sermon on the Mount. And it's here that Jesus is describing uh, what it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God operates. It's sort of like the new kingdom charter. What he's, what he's describing for us in chapter 5 is not necessarily things that will turn out like you want them to, but he's commanding us to do certain things because this is the way that God is. So jumping down to verse 23, Matthew 5, 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So there's a few things to note here. Uh, First, this is Jesus talking about our relationships with one another, right? He's not talking about Uh, He's not directly talking about our relationship to God. But he's saying if you're at the temple about to offer a sacrifice and you remember that uh, someone you know, a friend of yours, uh, has something against you or you have something against them, right? It doesn't say what exactly the problem is. It just says uh, right there in verse 23, you remember that your brother has something against you. It doesn't say how that came about. It just says that there is a problem. Go do whatever it takes to be reconciled to that person. Now note that it's not just talking about forgiveness, right? Forgiveness can be offered, but if it's not accepted, the relationship still hasn't been reconciled, right? Reconciliation assumes that, yes, forgiveness has taken place, but it also assumes that there has been an acceptance of that and the relationship is now restored to health. So there's a distinction there between forgiveness and reconciliation, Uh, But there's also the command here that you are to go and do whatever it takes, essentially, to be reconciled to this person. 
Okay, so in our interaction with one another, that is at least one command that uh, Jesus gives is that we ought to be reconciled with one another. We ought not to leave uh, open wounds, if you will, uh, fester for any longer than, uh, than possible, really. Okay, so the, there's a little bit of a difference when we look at our relationship with God and how reconciliation takes place between us and God. It nevertheless is a restoration of the relationship, but how it happens is significantly different than what we see here in Matthew 23. As we go through 2 Corinthians 5, I hope that will become very clear. So let's flip back to 2 Corinthians 5. And we will see here the source. Uh, first off, in verse 18, all this is from God. That is the source of reconciliation. All this is from God. Now, that little word, this, is referring to what comes before it, actually. Verse 17, which was read earlier, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That is what the word this is referring to. It's essentially referring to salvation. Right? Uh, the regeneration of a person. The old has gone away and they are a new creature. And Paul says, all of that is from God. But secondly, in verse 18, he's going to continue to talk about reconciliation, right? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. So salvation as a whole is from God, and reconciliation, which is a part of salvation, is also from God. That's also a helpful distinction to make. Reconciliation is not uh, equal to salvation, right? Salvation is kind of the generic term that we use that describes everything that happens when you choose to trust in Jesus, right? There's justification, there's propitiation, there's reconciliation, there's a process of sanctification, there's uh, soon to be glorification. Uh, so there's many parts of salvation. Reconciliation is just one of those parts. But what does it say? All this is from God. Now at this point, we haven't actually answered the question, uh, why do we need reconciliation with God? Right? So let's flip back to, not Genesis 3, we could go there, but let's flip back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. Of course, our relationship with God was initially broken in Genesis 3. There's no question about that. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created the heavens and the earth and everything, including us. And what did he say about it? It was very good, right? Or very beautiful. So there was a whole, a complete relationship. And then Genesis 3 came, and the relationship was broken. Isaiah 59 talks about that. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 12. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So we see from the prophet Isaiah the problem. The problem is not God, right? His arm is not so short that he can't reach out and save us. He's not hard of hearing, like I think I am sometimes, but he can hear us. What is it that caused the problem? Specifically, our iniquities have made a separation between us and God. Continuing then in verse 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. 
Now listen carefully. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. Okay, that's a long passage. There's a lot going on in there. Verse 15 and 16 speak directly to what we are talking about. What does verse 16 say? He saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no one to intercede. Verse 2, your iniquities have made a separation and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. There's no one who can stand in the gap, if you will, and make up for it. So, what does God do according to Isaiah? Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him, which of course speaks to Jesus. The source of reconciliation is God. The mediator of reconciliation is Jesus Christ. Going back to 2 Corinthians 5 then, all this is from God, who through Jesus Christ, the mediator of reconciliation, is the man Jesus Christ. Okay, God saw and he spoke through Isaiah very clearly. There's nothing you can do about it, right? I'm the only one who can do something about it. And so he took it upon himself and sent his son. But notice that there are a couple things in the Isaiah 59 passage that Jesus is coming to do. Right, verse 20, the one that we think of all the time, and a redeemer will come to Zion. The one that we don't think of, verse 18, according to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. Put that in your pocket and we'll come back to it. Okay, flipping back then to 2 Corinthians 5, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 59, 16. Right? Then his own arm brought salvation. God sent Jesus here. And how exactly did this uh, reconciliation take place? Paul tells us here in 2 Corinthians 5, Uh, Verse 21, at the end of uh, the chapter there. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let that sink in. How is it that we have been reconciled to God? He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might have the righteousness or we might become the righteousness of God. What exactly does it mean that Jesus became sin, that we became the righteousness of God? At first glance, it seems sort of like he's saying that Jesus actually uh, embodied sin right? And then we embodied righteousness. Let's flip over to Colossians and see if we can get a little bit more help on that. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, we get a similar passage that describes this a little bit differently. In Colossians 1, I'm going to start in verse 19. For in him, we're talking about Jesus, 
For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That doesn't sound like embodying sin, right? It sounds like the opposite. It sounds like embodying righteousness. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, here's our word again, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, peace is the result of reconciliation, making peace by the blood of his cross. Right? By the blood of his cross. Verse 21, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Okay, so you see that last verse there, 22, starts to hint at what Paul is also saying in 2 Corinthians 5. Right, what does he say? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. That's just like in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where Paul says that we might become the righteousness of God. So if we look at it this way, the way that we become the righteousness of God is we're declared righteous, right? Uh, I don't think anyone here would stand up and say, I embody the righteousness of God right here today, right? That's a part of a process of sanctification where one day we will be holy. Today, that's definitely not the case. Today, what is the case is that God has declared us righteous because of his son Jesus, whom he declared to be a sinner. Right? So there's a swap going on. When Jesus went to the cross, he took upon himself the penalty for our sin so that we could take upon ourselves the reward for righteousness. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All this is from God, who through Christ, Jesus is the answer to the problem in Genesis 3, to the problem in Genesis 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to Isaiah 59, and all the way to the end of Malachi, and all the way to today. What then is next? Well, the recipients of reconciliation. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. First of all, I have to convince you that you are merely a recipient. Remember, what part is it that you and I play in reconciliation? What does Isaiah 59, 16 say? There was no one to intercede. We don't play a part. See the tense of this word reconciled? Who through Christ reconciled? Duh. It's past tense. The work of reconciliation is done. It's completed. It's accomplished. Jesus did it on the cross. You and I play no part in the work of reconciliation. We do, however, receive it, right? Because reconciliation is a two-way street, like we talked about at the beginning. You can offer forgiveness. If it's not accepted, it's not the whole picture, right? It's a two-way street. So on the one hand, we cannot say to God, okay, I know I did some bad things, but I'm done with that, and uh, I'm just going to be nice and friendly to you now. That is not enough. That may clear up your enmity towards God. It does not clear up God's enmity towards you. This is the time where we go back to Romans 5, verse 8. Verse 8. 
If it was a few weeks later, I could just ask somebody to quote it, right? Anybody at random? And Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from, what? From the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's not enough for us to say, I'm sorry, God. There has to be a payment for our sin. And without that payment, there can be no reconciliation. We may, in our um, humble minds, we may offer God forgiveness, but that's not enough. Jesus, God, through Jesus, had to come and offer the sacrifice for sin so that God's enmity against us because of our sin could be put away. And then we can accept, we can receive the reconciliation that God accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. The recipients of reconciliation are you and me, and we are just that. We are all too often ungrateful, unworthy recipients of reconciliation. And yet at the same time, it is such a marvelous, wonderful, amazing, awesome thing that God has done. So what then is the responsibility? Flip back to 2 Corinthians 5. I know we're jumping around a little bit. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. Reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now what does that mean, to give us the ministry of reconciliation? Before you throw out an answer, remember, we cannot reconcile ourselves to God, right? So there's no way that we are going to reconcile anybody else to God. What Paul is not saying is go out and make everybody right with God. You can't do that. You can't do that for yourself. You can't do that for anyone else, right? It was God, through his son, Jesus Christ, who reconciled us to him. So what then does it mean? And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, verse 20, actually, is going to make it very clear. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And here's the phrase, God making his appeal through us. And then Paul says exactly what that looks like. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God making his appeal through us. The responsibility of accepting reconciliation is the recapitulation, if you will. It's the sharing of that. When we see, if we see, if we can get just a glimpse of what God has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ, while we were still sinners, while we were enemies, God sent his son to die for us, to pay for us, to restore the relationship. If we get just a glimpse of what that is, will we not have a passion to share it? Will we not say with Paul in verse 20, I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Not that you can reconcile yourself, but you can receive what Jesus Christ has already done on the cross. It's done. That's the beauty. You don't have to do it. You don't have to try to do it. You simply receive 
what God has already done for you. If that's not enough, in verse 10 of, of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Remember Isaiah 59. Jesus came as a redeemer. He also came as judge. And just like Paul says, there will be a day where we all stand before Christ. And the question will be, did you mock what I did for you on the cross? Or did you accept it with a grateful heart? Knowing that there was nothing you could do. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. The title of the sermon is Reconciliation Recapitulation. The recap part is in verse 19. Look what we have. That is, or that's another way of saying, in other words, or let me put it this way, or here's a recap. Paul is going to tell us in verse 19 just what he's told us in verse 18, using little different words. That is, in Christ, there's our mediator, God, there's the source, was reconciling the world to himself, past tense, recipients, that's us, not counting their trespasses against them. That's the what, what is reconciliation? And lastly, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That's the responsibility. So how is it then that reconciliation between us and God differs from reconciliation between one another? Predominantly, it is the fact that we can do nothing to reconcile ourselves to God. Truth be told, we can't even get rid of our own enmity towards God but we definitely cannot get rid of God's enmity towards us. It's just not possible. If it was, there would be no justice, and you could not call God just. But thankfully, God saw the problem, and he tells Isaiah, I looked, it displeased me that there was no justice, and I saw that there was no one who could do anything. And so his own arm brought salvation. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a righteous life, right? To be the embodiment of righteousness. <clears throat> and then died on the cross, taking the penalty for sin, which is what? Separation from God. What did Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? took on our sin so that we could take on his righteousness. I think there's no more fitting conclusion than what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you were here this morning and you have never accepted the forgiveness of God, offered through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Now is the time. Today is the day. There may not be a tomorrow. The longer you reject, the longer you mock what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, the longer you say, it's not that big of a deal, I can handle it myself, the more judgment you heap upon yourself when you have to stand before Jesus. And on that day, you will see clearly the gravity of the situation. I implore you today, be reconciled to God. And I implore those of us who have been reconciled, do we see what God has done for us? Do we really see what God has done for us in removing our sin? 
Does that not motivate us to tell others? Look and see what God has done. Let's pray.